How's that? No, much better. Okay. Thank you very much for showing up for the last talk of the night. Yeah. Only the best time slot. Very classy. Everybody tells me I'm the best presenter. Just ask. So I'm Courtney Falk. Um, we've had talks today about espionage, counterintel, and we've had talks about uh, machine learning. So this talk kind of ties it all together. So this is probably a fitting time slot for it. Helps if you uh, plug in your pointer first. There we go. So my day job is threat intelligence. This is actually a side project for me. Uh, my PhD at Purdue actually did natural language processing. Uh, the application was more for detecting phishing emails, but a lot of the general concepts still apply. We're still trying to classify between two different classes, um, but we'll see that the actual um, material differs quite substantially. Um, in a previous life, I was a Fed, so I feel legally obligated to say that all information in this report is from public and open source uh, material, so none of this is from a uh, classified background. You've probably seen this trope in a Hollywood movie. You know someone is crazy when you walk into a room and they have a bunch of pictures up on the wall and a bunch of twine going between the pictures and they're using this as a rationale for their crazy conspiracy theory. So this is my twine, and I did this in Maltigo. Uh, shortly after the election, I, I got very frustrated because I'm like reading the news, and I said to myself, who is this guy's name again? So I popped open Maltigo. Uh, it's really a more a network analysis tool, so I'm abusing it in this way. But I started creating this chart. And I was just trying to keep straight who is who and who are they related to. Um, and this is out of date. This is from a couple weeks ago. This is about 800 nodes at this point. Um, but this is my inspiration. This is a problem that really, really bothers me. And I was hoping to find a good solution for it. Um, so what we're going to talk about real quick, I'm going to hit some background material in case you're not up to speed. I'm going to talk a little bit about machine learning and natural language processing, which isn't enough to really get you started but I'll try to whet your appetite a little bit. And at the very end, uh, we'll talk about what the actual findings were of this research. So the background material. As you may or may not know, in the 2016 presidential election, uh, there was some interference by parties that have been attributed to uh, Russia in how social media was conducted um, kind of opinion making and that kind of material. This resonated with me because going back to 2015 at um, international conferences I'd been to, I heard some research from some Finnish researchers who said this exact same thing. They said, we are concerned with Russian trolls on Finnish social media uh, interfering with public perceptions, which kind of struck something with me. Now. As a side note, Finnish is a much more difficult language to process because um, in Finnish you've got uh, nouns can be inflected by 11 cases and three genders. So in theory, each noun could have 33 different forms. So uh, try solving that problem in Python. Um, and we weren't, so th this is a problem that goes back. And that wasn't, 2015 wasn't the first time the Finns had struggled with that. And since then, we've passed our problem down to uh, the French and the British and the Germans. Um, the Spaniards are still dealing with it. And we, we're already seeing signs of this coming up for the 2018 midterms. We're fully expecting to see the same thing again. So time will tell if we actually react any better to it. <laughs> so here's an example of what happened. I, I'm specifically looking at Twitter in my NLP research right now. But this isn't confined to Twitter. Um, it's on Reddit, and if you're on Reddit, you've seen the underscore Donald and all the delight that they have. Um, this happened on Facebook. The numbers I, I saw were that um, the, the trolls spent $46,000 on Facebook ads, while the two presidential candidates spent $81 million. So th this gives you an example of the scope of the problem. They spent $46,000, which is roughly a, 
um, probably a low-end luxury sedan. And I think it's safe to say they achieved very effective results for that. This here is an actual physical confrontation um, that they incited in Texas. The two fake uh, Facebook groups created by the trolls, one was um, anti-immigrant and one was pro-Islam, and they organized two, unbeknownst to the two groups, they organized two rallies for the same place at the same time. You know, it's like putting two cats in a bag and shaking it, and this is what you get. So someone was very delighted with the effectiveness of this. So these are the people we're talking about. And um, even before 2016, they had names. They're called the Trolls from Olgano. Uh, they were the Web Brigades. And this is their headquarters. And it's at, um, I didn't put the street down here. Um, it's on the north end of um, St. Petersburg in Russia. Uh, if you email me, I'll give you a copy of the slides with notes. Um, there are a couple news articles. Um, this, this group has been repeatedly infiltrated by journalists. So you get a couple different views of the kinds and types of work that they're doing and against different sources. Uh, Sweden, you wouldn't think Sweden would be very offensive, but um, Russia has conducted operations against them as well. Um, they, they are named the Internet Research Agency, which is one of those kind of innocuous sounding names. It doesn't sound very sinister. Uh, and they are named, along with several of their aliases, in uh, Mueller's indictment. This is the guy who owns them. This is uh, Yevgeny Prigozhin. His um, nickname is Putin's chef. He's the more bald one here. Um, he owns not just this, but he owns uh, possibly the largest catering company in St. Petersburg. And he has massive um, contracts with the Kremlin that were obtained under semi or fully fraudulent um, uh, bidding processes. And if you know Alexei Navalny, who is an opposition leader in Russia, he has done re corruption reporting on this bidding process. So if you go online, you can learn more. The Anti-Corruption Foundation is uh, Navalny's organization. So from the rat's nest diagram I showed you at the beginning, uh, this is Prigozhin up here, and this is the same picture. Um, so he's connected to the Internet Research Agency that's cited in the indictment. He's also connected to um, some less savory guys, um, a fellow named Utkin, who operates a Russian mercenary outfit who um, are currently fighting in Syria. So one interesting thing I've found by dabbling in this social network of the Russian oligarchs are it's not six degrees, it's like perhaps two to get from any one person to something really kind of nasty. Um, I was told yesterday I need to have a Sun Tzu quote, so here's your Sun Tzu quote. Um, and of course, Machiavelli has plenty of good advice. This bottom line, uh, has anybody seen the movie uh, Arrival? Amy Adams, Jeremy Renner. I had to look this up because um, the CIA agent has a throwaway line. He's like, the Hungarians have a name for pitting people against each other. And it's called, um, the translation is slicing the salami. I don't speak Hungarian. But this, it was a strategy used by the Hungarian Communist Party basically to undermine and destroy uh, their opponents by having them infight and then pick off the smaller groups. So why is Russia doing this? And this is a very concrete example right here. This is the F-22 on the left. First flight is 1997. This was the first fifth generation um, uh, air superiority fighter fielded. And over here is the Su-57, and that first flight was in 2010. So over a decade later, um, and no one else has really fielded a fifth generation fighter in between if you ignore the F-35 and some of the, the Chinese version of the F-35. Chinese, Chinese uh, well, I mean, even the Su-57 kind of looks like an Su-27 and an F-22 got together and made some bad decisions. <laughs> right, you see a lot of the same lines here. But we won't go into that. But this is an example. When the Soviet Union fell apart, basically all funding for strategic military projects fell apart. Um, fighter development, uh, submarines, ballistic missiles to be fired from the submarines. They sold their aircraft carrier to China, who fielded it. As their first aircraft carrier, China now has fielded their own indigenously built aircraft carrier. That's another presentation. 
but this is what they've lost. They are not a military threat on par with the United States at this point. So what do you do at this point? They have a concept for this, and uh, some of the early sources I see go back to the mid-90s, and they call it reflexive control. So the concept of reflexive control is you create an environment um, in the enemy's territory, you feed them fake information, you feed them fake uh, perceptions, with, and you're trying to shape the psychology to make them make the decision you want them to make. So it's not an overt thing, we're not parking our tanks on the border, we're lying to them and we're pitting them against each other. This fellow down here, he's, um, he used to be an aide to President Putin. His name's uh, Vladislav Surkov. He writes under the name uh, Natan Dubovitsky, or Nathan sometimes. Um, I actually tried reading this. It's called Without a Sky, in which he defines this term of nonlinear warfare. I can't claim that it made a whole lot of sense, so maybe I need to try reading it again. But the idea being that um, the death of the conventional ideas of warfare. And uh, if you read, I, I won't recommend you read it because it's a painfully boring book, but it's called Recasting the Red Star by Timothy Thomas. It's part academic literature review and part military document, so it's a special kind of boring. <laughs> but he is like the exhaustive source. He, he's talked to everybody. He has all the original Cyrillic uh, publications. And uh, he talks about the, these kind of information operations and how they integrate into the Russian conception of warfare. And this is a quote um, that I took from him. This goes back to 1995 by uh, Colonel Leonenko. Um, in fact, the enemy comes up with a decision based on the idea of the situation which he has formed. So this is his definition of reflexive warfare. We, we put the idea in their head and then we just let them go about doing it. So that's the problem. That's where we find ourselves. Um, and I have a background more in information security. So when I approach machine learning and I approach natural language processing, I do it first as a computer scientist and a security guy, and then second as a, a linguist or something along those lines. So machine learning, uh, it's the hot newness, right? Every product's got to have machine learning. It's a part of artificial intelligence, but it's, it's not the whole of it. Um, we're, we're trying to build up something that can find patterns in data that a human can't. Either in big data terms, there's more data than we could possibly go through, or perhaps the patterns are too subtle or too complex. Basically, uh, let's throw some linear algebra mixed with some calculus at it and Kachow patterns, right? Um, and that's, that's basically how it comes up with. You could slice and dice this several different ways, uh, depending on the kind of problem you have. If you need to fit a line, you do regression. In our case, we're going to go with classification. And then based on the kinds of data you have, um, if you don't know what you have, basically you go with an unsupervised method. You've got a giant chunk of data. We'll see if there's some kind of structure we can tease out of it. But in our case, luckily, it, we have two labels of data. We've got troll and non-troll. So in that case, we can go with a supervised method, which should produce better results. Natural language processing is also, in terms of a Venn diagram, these could both be under artificial intelligence with some overlap. So uh, natural language processing builds on the social science aspects of linguistics, um, the computer science aspects of computational linguistics and the, the math of machine learning. The problem is human languages are inherently ambiguous, which is both the power and the difficulty in processing a human language. Uh, because it's ambiguous, we can express an in, uh, infinity of different possibilities, but also it makes it really difficult to parse. Um, so we are we are going to take some of the machine learning and we're going to try and see if we can apply it to see if we can pick out trolls better than what's currently the state of the art. So th this project came to me when NBC announced that they had harvested, um, was it about uh, 203,000 tweets 
that Twitter had deleted. So they identified this set of Russian troll accounts and they basically purged everything in whatever infinite wisdom that Twitter has. They just did away with it, but NBC thought there might be some value in preserving it. So if you, um, if you down, if you get a copy of the slide with the notes, it'll have a link. You can, or you can search for NBC Twitter trolls. It's a CSV file. You can download it and parse it yourself. Um, so I thought this was a gold mine. It was a couple months before Circle City Con, so I thought this would be my way in, my way to give a first talk and do something concrete and useful. So the first thing I did was uh, think about what are we going to try and learn? What kind of things are we going to pull out of this text? And what I found very quickly is that um, most of the tweets that are attributed to trolls were retweets, which right there and there I decided to uh, split them off. So if you think about it, a retweet is not your original thoughts, right? You're basically just pointing at someone else and saying, that's a good idea, listen to that guy. And that's not a good way to detect trolls necessarily, because then they can hide by just retweeting one person over and over. So when we do natural language processing in this talk, I'm specifically going to talk about the original tweets that are not a retweet of someone else. This is the timeline of the data that NBC re uh, released. So the, the tweets start at the end of 2014 here. And the red line is the um, nomination of Donald J. Trump as Republican presidential candidate. Green line is the election itself. And the blue line is the inauguration. Now, I, I have no no support for this analysis, but I find it really weird that these lines seem to really bracket the peak of the activity really well. This probably doesn't say that they necessarily supported Trump or Clinton other than, yeah, they were really in this for this specific instance. This kind of low-level activity through uh, 2015 and 2016, that's probably, um, I would call it backstopping. So when you create um, a fake like spy persona, you're going to be hacker man, you have to um, establish some kind of background, right? You don't just walk in and say, I just got my license, I just got my credit card. Of course I am who I say I am. You've got to create a history. Um, I see this a lot on Reddit. Like, um, does anyone browse the AW subreddit? That place is terrible. It's totally infested by um, trolls. Well, people who are basically um, trying to game up their karma on Reddit for use later. They're, they're retweeting, uh, reposting pictures, and this is basically what they're doing. They're engaging in a discourse in order to establish their authority. So when come time, like the week of the election, you know, they're not going to get filtered out as here's a brand new account who's saying go vote for Trump. They're going to have this social network established already that they can then build on and exploit from. This is something, um, I'm, I've done the Coursera class in social network analysis, but I'm not an expert. Um, there's too much data in here to really be able to tease it apart and give you a visual representation. It's a giant mess. But the, the red at the bottom are the Russians, and the blue at the top are the people they retweeted. But you do see some kind of structure here. You see this kind of clustering where certain groups are favoring retweeting certain groups which uh, the idea that gave to me was there might be some kind of small, either structured organization within the Internet Research Agency or possibly just kind of cliques of coworkers who are like, oh, yeah, here's a, good, here's a good account I found. The Americans love it. Let's go with that. So the complications. Like any good technology project, um, nothing goes right um, the first time through. I have uh, some background experience with the Weka framework and tools, um, which are great. Uh, they're a free, they're a set of free tools written in Java with a GUI available from the University of Waikato in uh, New Zealand. But there are problems I had with it. Their CSV loader actually can't read the RFC format for CSV but luckily Apache can, so I was able to hack something together. Um, there, there are some questions about like how do we 
how do we um, mark up some of these things? Like, do we treat every single um, Twitter um, handle the same, or do we treat it separately? I mean, we just saw here that you're going to almost never see the same Twitter handle more than a handful of times. So what I did specifically was just any time I saw a Twitter handle, I just create a special markup tag for it and substituted that. So we're not trying to identify and trace through every single Twitter user because that would just skew our results. This is also an approach um, from the uh, Stanford folks, the guys who do Glove. Um, this is the same approach they did when generating their word vectors. Um, and a practical problem I had is I was using that poor laptop over there that's like uh, six years old at this point, and it just it couldn't handle the uh, the gigabytes of data that were involved. It, this isn't even like big data in terms of big data, but the laptop couldn't take it, so I had to do a random sample down to something that's manageable. So we're starting to see where some of the bias and error might creep into our experiment. So now we've got our data. We've kind of waded through some of the um, problems you'll have in writing your own code. So how are we now going to start doing some experiments? Um, so basically, I just took the same approach that I did within my dissertation. I had uh, three, three algorithms, uh, machine learning algorithms, that I preferred. They all represent, each represents um, uh, a slightly different approach. Um, there's a distinction between generative and discriminative algorithms. So generative are approaches that you train the model and then you can then use the model to generate new output. So like um, in theory, like you could train um, a generative model on the Russian tweets and then have it start generating new Russian tweets for you, which is an idea I kicked around, but I ran out of time, so sorry. Uh, the discriminative is basically just, we don't have that ability, we're just gonna say, draw a line in the sand, say these are and these are not. So you lose some abilities with that. Um, but also I was interested in not overfitting the data, so did some uh, k-fold cross-validation with that. And I was also interested in, um, in the language model we were using. So this is, this is um, bag of words, which basically means we're not preserving the structure of the document. We're basically just, at its most basic level, we're counting words that are basically in a big un unordered set. Um, and that seems to work well enough for a lot of basic NLP applications. So I did it for um, sequences of one, two, and three words, which is an approximation of structure. And for English, it seems to work well enough. Um, I can't claim that this would necessarily work for all different kinds of languages, which is another problem I ran into. Um, the trolls didn't necessarily tweet just in English. So um, German actually is a lot of what I saw that I could easily recognize as not being um, English. Uh, some Portuguese, some French. So this is not really important for the sake of the talk, um, but if you want to go back and try to replicate what I'm doing, here are some of the settings you can go through in terms of how I got my data. Um, for my control data, I basically just created my own Twitter app. You get Twitter to generate a key for you, and then you can drop your key into like a Python script and just start pulling data down. So I pulled down um, twice the amount of the troll data. <coughs> Pardon me. Um, so that would be something you'd do. I'm not going to release that data because I'm not clear on what the licensing terms are for um, re-releasing data that you've downloaded with your Twitter app. And based on the Cambridge Analytica situation, I'm just not going to touch that at all. So this, this is the end result. Like if this one slide sums up all the work I did, it's this, which is really depressing because I spent a lot of hours on this and it's just this slide. But basically, I talked about um, the language modeling. So here on the left, we talk about unigrams are one word, bigram two, trigram three. And then up here are the different statistics I was using to measure the different words, either 
one or zero if the word's present, the number of times it's present, or TFIDF is uh, term frequency inverse document frequency, which is a statistic that tells you how important that word is to that document that's not found elsewhere, right? So what kind of word makes this document unique? And so I did this all for all the three different models, 27 different data points. And this is what I got in the end. And you'll be forgiven for thinking it looks pretty much the same because it does. So one of the things I found is that um, you really don't gain anything by increasing the complexity of your model in this case. So counting three words instead of counting one word doesn't necessarily give you a better result. Or even um, doing the term frequency is not necessarily better than just, you know, marking one or zero for, for the statistic. Um, in fact, if you see the red guy is uh, the naive Bayes model, um, he actually is the best up here at the simplest situation. He goes down a little bit, and then you see down here with the trigram uh, model and the term frequency, he does actually the worst, which seems counterintuitive. You would think um, the more uh, rigorous, the more um, involved algorithm would give you the better results. It's not necessarily the case in this point. Um, the best guy was actually here. This is uh, SVMs, our support vector machines. It's a discriminative model, which basically means we've got this series of points in space, and we are going to draw one line through all those points and say everything over here is good, everything over here is bad, A, B. And that actually ended up providing the best results, which also seems kind of counterintuitive. How can arbitrarily drawing a, that's not arbitrary, how could drawing a line through our problem space be the best solution? But that is what the data shows. And we see down here, uh, the precision never really goes below 0.7, but the recall seems to improve a little bit. So precision is, um, now I'm gonna draw a blank. Precision is how many of your correct instances were the true positive? And uh, we'll, we'll see why that never really goes below 0.7 here in a second. So um, of these three, uh, we talked about uh, naive Bayes is basically we're just seeing uh, how frequently a word occurs in a document, support vector machine. We've talked about it's basically drawing a line through space. And then this guy's a decision tree. So was anyone here for um, Amir's earlier machine learning talk? He talked about um, decision trees, and this is what you end up with, something that's not legible on the screen. But it basically creates a literal tree structure, a branching tree structure, where each node is like a decision point. And in our case, because it's language, each decision point is a word. So this tree was built by picking first a word that best splits the, the group in two, and then proceeding down from there. In the end, this ended up being several hundred nodes long. But what's useful in visualizing this is it uses um, the same algorithm used in um, dimensionality reduction. So sometimes you don't know which of the things you're measuring are the most important. And there's a series of um, meta-algorithms you can use in machine learning um, for feature selection when you don't really know what the most important thing is. So this functions as a visual way of seeing what is actually the most important thing here. So as it turns out, the top guy up at the Trump, the top, sorry, is Trump, followed by Clinton, politics, PJNet, the hashtag, turns, I think that's a Patriot Journalist Network. I didn't read through it, but what I glanced at, at Twitter looks very alt-righty. Um, which would then support why the next one is Islam kills and followed by Trump for president. Um, the next one down that is on there is actually um, uh, Merkel muss bleiben, which translates to Merkel must stay. So this is data from ostensibly around the time of the American presidential election, but that's already looking forward to the German election. Merkel survived that, but in that election, the um, AFD, which is the alternative for Germany party, which is their most recent right-wing party, uh, uh, was able to 
secure more support than they had in the past, but they didn't unseat Merkel. So what have we learned from all these charts? In the end, um, this is the best performing model I had. The green is really what you want to see. Um, so up at the top left, how many troll tweets do we actually catch? And down on the lower right, how many of the good ones do we let go? And then you start to see the false positive, how many of the good ones do we think are trolls? Now up at the top right, we see how many of the trolls do we let through? What this table is telling you is that um, Twitter will never accept or implement this as like an automatic, um, automatic ban mechanism. But as I said that, I actually start to rethink that because if anyone has been on YouTube long enough, you'll know that reliance on automated detection mechanisms is something they almost certainly do without considering the consequences first. But here are the consequences. Down here on the lower left are a bunch of poor people, grandparents, siblings, bosses, who are going to have their accounts banned because an algorithm determined that they were a troll. And then up in the lower upper right are trolls who are still able to get their job done. And you start to see that we're, we're still letting through fully a third of the troll tweets, which is not terribly effective. So where are these like, good-looking numbers starting to come from? They're coming from the fact that we have more control data than we have troll data, and we're actually much better at identifying the control data. And if you start to dig through it, you see why. It's because a lot of the control data doesn't talk about uh, Trump or Clinton or the presidential election, despite what Trump might have you believe. Not everyone cares about the election anymore. So those are the ones that are very easily going to fall into this true negative category. And that kind of skews the metric in the end. Now, we can tune this to an extent. If I had unlimited amount of time and resources, I could go in and try to tune the false positive rate down as far as it would go. Ideally, it'd have to be zero to really be something that an actual social network would implement. The downside being uh, what you see when you develop these models is as you tune down the false positive rate, the false negative rate's going to go up. So we're already letting through a third of the trolls as we try to be good to everyone who's using the platform legitimately, we're going to end up letting more of the trolls through anyway. So this, I would classify um, in academic language, it would be called a negative finding, which is a fancy way of saying there's nothing good to be seen here. Um, there's this really, one of my big frustrations in dealing with the machine learning community is that they seem to chase um, metrics and they chase data sets. So unless you have your model A operating on data set B to get result C, and unless C is like 0 0.01 higher than the state of the art, no one cares. So if you were to take this to an actual computer science journal, it would never get published. Um, and then at the same time, we've already seen that this will not be the panacea to any kind of social network problem. Um, as a quick aside, when you're doing machine learning, we've trained this on tweets. So in machine learning, there's this concept of generalizability. Um, we have a model that's trained on A. How do we take that and apply it to more general problems? And does it work when you take it to more general problems? We've trained this on Twitter data. If we took it and tried to catch Facebook trolls with it, it would probably perform terribly. Um, if you think about it, tweets are written in a certain way. There's a certain style and a language to them that you won't find on Facebook. So we have problems with generalizability as well. So just building this and thinking that you can put it in front of the stream of data for your social network and filtering out all the bad stuff, that's just not going to work. What we need is something more comprehensive. So if you remember, I talked about um, partly the social network analysis involved in looking at where these who's tweeting what, uh, who's, who might be connected. Um, so really, um, I'm a threat intelligence guy, so threat intelligence is my hammer and this problem is the nail. In this situation, 
um, you're almost certainly going to have some, some kind of human in the loop. You're going to need some kind of human analyst who is uh, able to tr and train to investigate this situation. You can't arbitrarily ban people. Um, this might be a tool for developing leads. So you could automatically generate a set of leads and then feed that to your analysts to start to track down. Um, in my research, I have not found an information sharing and uh, analysis center dedicated to social media. So the ISACs are uh, groups focused to certain business verticals and they share threat intelligence. So there's uh, FN ISAC is financial services. Um, there's one for the automotive industry. There's one for everybody, but I don't think there's one for social media. I really don't know how successful you'd be in um, getting these different companies to cooperate. Um, and something else that's a personal complaint of mine is there seems to be no social problem that Silicon Valley thinks they cannot build a technology to solve. So I'm afraid that these points, these negative points about why you should not do this would just be glossed over. Someone will say, oh, with more data we could blah, 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 or with the state of the art we could blah, 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 and I, I, don't, I don't see us getting from here to there. I don't think there's some magical algorithm that we can apply and get amazingly better results. There are things I'd like to fix about this given enough time. Um, I talked about the language stuff, um, trying to filter out non-English. That was mostly not a problem unless you sprechen Sie Deutsch. And then um, one thing I was interested in is hashtags are this interesting linguistic phenomenon where they're meant to be like this uniquely identifiable string, but the string itself contains content. So we might be able to derive something from that. Uh, sentiment analysis uh, is a natural language processing application where basically we try to determine the uh, mindset or the opinions of the person who's uh, posting and that might be something good to measure and include with this kind of approach. And also um, neural nets, that's just something I didn't have time to get to. Uh, Weka does not support neural networks um, so that's basically why I didn't have time to rewrite all this in TensorFlow. But everything I've done here, you can do in Weka, you can do in um, Scikit-Learn, you can do in uh, Keras or TensorFlow. Basically, these algorithms are so basic that they'll be available everywhere. So something I, I don't like to throw out fear, uncertainty, and doubt, and just like cast people out into the world because that's not very helpful. So here are some thoughts about what we can actually take away from this and learn. And the first is good information hygiene. So I have young kids. Something I think about is um, as they go online, you know, they're, they're, they're nice kids, but they're, they're really naive. You know, they, they need that tough love lesson about not everything on the internet is true. Most everything on the internet is wrong, actually. So you need to keep that in mind. You need to think about where this information is coming from. Is it from a reputable source? I don't, I don't really buy into the whole fake news thing. So like when I see something from CNN or BBC or New York Times or the Washington Post, I treat that as a lot more trustworthy than my aunt or my uncle who are posting something about a uh, satanic cult in Kansas or something like that. Be judicious about what you share online, which is a related lesson we've taken away from this from Cambridge Analytica. They were supposedly on our side well, they, they were on somebody's side in America participating in the election and they were doing mic micro-targeting. So they were taking the content that everybody shared in social media and turning it against them, um, refining the message to specifically get into your head. And if the Internet Research Agency is not doing that yet, they almost certainly will be. Uh, Russia has a long history of having a very robust STEM program. They make excellent engineers and computer scientists and mathematicians and logicians. So this is certainly something that's within their capabilities. But really, more fundamental things we have to address are how we interact with one another. Um, 
Nothing makes me turn off my computer faster than like the discourse on Reddit or, God forbid, YouTube. People are so quick just to throw out a label and to generalize and to lump someone into a category. Um, oh, I, I love picking on the politics subreddit because the name would suggest it's one thing, but <laughs> really, you only go on politics if you have a certain political viewpoint. Um, and that's not helpful. Like, if you go through the comments on politics, almost certainly the, the first or second tier uh, post is going to be something about something, something, the Republicans, or the fundies, or the conservatives, and, like, you're not helping. Like, if you feel that you are so right, you have this inassailable position, you have this immor moral obligation to reach out and engage someone in a constructive dialogue um, in a way that not necessarily will appeal to them, but that bridges that gap. And calling people names is the quickest way to shut that down. Uh, contact your representatives. They almost certainly will not do anything about it, but you're doing something. So that's been my trend for the year. Um, it has taught me, though, um, very quickly about who I will and will not vote for again. Um, I respect someone who at least takes the time to give me an automatic email response because I found that actually some of my, concern, uh, my uh, representatives don't actually do that. So very quickly, I'm of the mindset that if they can't be bothered to send me that automatic email of, I'm glad you're concerned about issue, you know, insert macro here. If they can't be bothered to do that, I don't want them representing me. And finally, vote, vote, vote. Um, if you're a U.S. citizen and you're over 18, register to vote. We have elections coming up in the fall. Um, think critically <laughs> about the candidates that you're going to support. So thanks uh, to Valpo Hacks. Um, those guys let me come up and do an early version of this talk. And uh, some of the things I learned from working on it and presenting to them helped refine and make this a little bit more accurate. Uh, thanks again to the University of uh, Waikato uh, for producing Weka. It, it has warts, but it, it still is a fantastic tool. You can't beat the price. And thanks again for Circle City Con for giving me uh, a venue for my first talk here. So with that, um, we've got a couple minutes left. So you can go to dinner or you can ask questions. So if, if I understand the presentation correctly, we're having a difficult time understanding who the Russian polls are or who the Russian bots are through machine language. Why can you not use some of the same tactics as the micro, like Cambridge Analytica is, finding micro and applying those tactics to find the bots? Is there a grouping? certain content, can you not then group that content and then search and destroy those bots and then learn more from that? Without under, having an inside view to some of the technologies that Cambridge used, I actually tried. So uh, Reuters had a news article where they talked about that one of the guys in my rat's nest wrote a paper about like, you know, the advent of information warfare and politics or something. They won't release that. So it's difficult to say, the, but my guess is the Cambridge Analytica approach used a, a lot more structure in its data. So if you go back, the researcher who downloaded all the data was having people do basically personality surveys. So they were giving, they were modeling the <laughs> interior psychological state of their own mind for someone else. And that's where a lot of his micro-targeting value came from. So it, it wasn't just we've got this text blob and we can read into someone's mind. That's called uh, psychometrics. Um, I haven't seen that work very well. But um, that won't necessarily get you that structure. But if you can get someone to say, like, you know, what's your sexual orientation, what's your religion, what's your political party, you're starting to give them some very precise clues. So it's not just a text blob. It's this field, this value, this field, this value, you've got a much more clear picture at that point. So that's why we can't do it. Um, although through some of this research that other people have done, we have learned about them. One of them is living in Seattle right now. Um, I didn't remember her in time, but if you look up Russian troll in Seattle, her and her husband, 
got a visa, and I think he got a job with Facebook. So, go Facebook. Any other questions? All right, go have a drink.